my name is Avery. I am a non-binary trans person. I'm a queer person. I'm sort of a professional data geek. Um, I really appreciate what uh, Charlotte said about coming from a non-tech background because obviously a law degree is definitely required to be a database manager. That is my background. Um, so I kind of came sideways at tech. Uh, but I have worked with several nonprofit organizations at the national level on data management and have also encountered the issues that I'm going to discuss today as an employee and a consumer and even an OkCupid okay user. Um, there'll be some <laughs> examples related to that. Um, so if you work with data of any kind um, that's about people, then there are trans and gender non-conforming people in your data. Um, and so we're taking sort of a broad perspective here that these tips are intended to have benefit not just for trans and gender non-conforming populations, but beyond that. Um, so, doop doop doop, maybe, maybe not. Hey, look, it's me. Okay, so um, feel free if you have any questions uh, after this talk to tweet me at Queer Activist. Um, and also, I have a longer version of what I'm going to be talking about today that hopefully, if WordPress cooperates, should be going live right about now at radicallyqueer.com. There's a lot more practical tips um, that hopefully you can use. So, five steps for trans inclusive data. Step number one. Um, balance your needs carefully when you're collecting personal data. So there's no one right answer for how to make your data more trans-inclusive. You really have to come from a purpose-driven approach and ask yourself, why are you collecting data in the first place? Um, so before you even think about your data structure, think about what are your present and future needs. Why are you collecting data in the first place? Um, are you, do you need data to contact people, to... Uh, enhance their user experience, to um, maybe uh, assist them legally, or to publish data about them, to target them for programming, to do analytics. Um, and then once you think about that, can you imagine a future world where your data needs might actually uh, increase and hit uh, more of those than you did at first? And then once you've considered that, uh, you might want to think about, particularly if you're asking questions about gender or whether somebody belongs to a gender or sexual minority, such as trans or gender queer, gender nonconforming, um, you might want to ask yourself, what degree of specificity do you actually need? So if you're doing really broad-based programming, you may not need to ask somebody's gender at all. Um, whereas, let's say you're working, um, designing a system for medical professionals or public health professionals, then you, you might need to ask questions such as whether someone has an intersex condition, what someone's specific medical transition history is that would be completely irrelevant in other contexts. Whatever you're using the data for, do a cost-benefit analysis. What is the burden um, that you might be causing to the people that you're asking for data from versus the benefit that you might be providing or the need that you have for that data. And then once you've, oops, there we go. Once you've thought about that broadly, um, then you're going to start thinking about how you're going to structure your data. So it's always better to think in advance um, about how you're going to structure your data than it is to have to try to turn around and fix mistakes later. I think a lot of us probably know that um, if we've had to fix those mistakes. So, um, for example, if you end up having to go more specific or more general over time, then you might not be able to accurately migrate data back and forth. Um, you want to think about your audience in advance. Make sure that the questions you're ask asking actually make sense to the people that you're asking them to. Um, and be culturally inclusive. So one example of this um, from my personal experience is working with a nonprofit organization predominantly working in communities of color, working with a lot of low-income folks, um, we asked uh, a question about gender. And I noticed that the person who had initially figured out how to ask this question, they were aware um, that gender might go beyond just male and female, and they wanted to do better. Um, the resource that they went to was the first thing that they found on the internet that looks like an expert resource, and that was a human rights campaign, which, if you're not familiar with it, is kind of a large, corporately funded, kind of capital G gay, um, very white organization. You can tell I'm a big fan of the human rights campaign. Um, and so maybe the gender options that they provided didn't speak to the people who we were actually asking the question to. And so, um, like, I'm a white person and I could see that. So the first thing I did was said, I don't really know what the answer is. So let me look at um, resources about gender and sexuality language that are written by people of color. Let me talk to some organizations um, that work on uh, gender and sexuality um, issues that are led by people of color um, and see what language would be more appropriate. 
And then finally, when you're thinking about data structure, um, keep in mind that you can always ask for alternatives. So um, for example, you could ask separately about somebody's LGBT identity um, versus their gender. You can ask for a free text field in addition to a forced choice. So I know sometimes when we're working with data, free text is scary because we can't really analyze it, we can't quantify it, but you can ask for both. You can say male, female, or something else, and then give a nice broad space for people to define that. Um, this is my first OkCupid okay example. Um, so OkCupid okay uh, recently changed their gender options. Hooray, you now can pick something other than male or female. Um, so that's the good news. The bad news is that um, they weren't really thinking about alternatives. So when I said that I'm non-binary, the first thing OkCupid okay asked me was, hey, we see that you're non-binary. Would you prefer to show up in search results for men, women, or both? And I kind of looked at that and was like, okay, I see what you're doing. <laughs> However, um, I would suggest that you provide a different alternative. What if you said to the user, hey, I noticed that you've picked a non-binary gender option. You might not be aware that X percentage of our users only search for men or women. And so if you would like, optionally, you can choose to be included in one or both of those groups along with the gender you've chose. Give some check boxes. You know, which of these groups would you like to be shown in in search results so that we can make the choice whether we actually want to show up um, in the search for men or women. Um, because again, OkCupid okay, probably didn't think far enough in advance, and so a lot of people don't know that those options have changed, so they may be searching for men or women when they really would be searching for more if they were aware. Um, I put things down, I swear to God. All right, um, so number three, once you get to the point where you're actually um, starting to ask questions um, and think about how you're going to collect data and how you're gonna store it, Ask for gender, pronouns, and even for someone's name in a contextual fashion. So rather than using sort of generic and possibly value-laden language like asking for someone's birth name, asking for someone's legal name, or even asking for someone's preferred name, um, that's not necessarily always clear. Instead, ask questions in context. Um, so for example, uh, if you're asking for a phone number, what name should we call you by if we're going to call you? Um, when you're asked for an address, have a name field that goes with that address. Uh, if you are collecting donations, what's the name that should appear on the tax receipt? Or what's, the name, uh, what's your billing name if you're asking for credit card information? Um, if you're hosting an event like this one, um, ask uh, what name should be on the badge. So um, once you've figured out the context that you're asking, um, you want to include help text on the front end so that the user knows what you're asking for and keep that initial context with the data on the back end. Um, I had an experience working for a trans org where we totally knew that we needed to ask for different names. Um, and we had the standard first name, last name, and then um, we added on a preferred name and a legal name option to the, to the standard system. Um, but even with that, we couldn't always tell when people just gave first last. We didn't always necessarily know what to use that name for. And then even if we had a good idea of like what was the old name and what was the new name, that didn't always work for us functionally. Because let's say we were issuing a tax receipt. Somebody might have given us a preferred name, and we don't know whether they've updated their name legally and which tax receipt name we should use. Or let's say we're going to call somebody. Um, you know, we might have a preferred name, but let's say this is a younger trans person living with parents or somebody who's early in their transition and might be living with someone who isn't aware of their new name. You could raise a lot of questions by calling them on the phone and asking for that name. But always using the old name also doesn't work because what if you're calling somebody who's, uh, who lives with somebody who doesn't know their transition history and using an old name also will raise a lot of questions. So just ask in context. Um, and that brings me to... The next one, avoid outing and uh, protect privacy. So honestly evaluate the privacy that your systems can offer, both technological and human systems, the processes you have in place around data, and be transparent with your users about their expectation of privacy. Only take data that you actually need, which I realize can be really hard in a data-driven society, but I promise you that to my knowledge, an optional field has never actually killed anyone that I know of. Um, they're okay. Uh, and then think about whether one person might be obvious in statistics. So a really good example of this, um, of a coworker who did this really well, 
um, there was a staff survey, and she let me know, uh, hey, Avery, you know, we did this survey. It had a bunch of uh, questions where we could complain if we wanted to about our, our, our work or our bosses. Um, and then it was going to the leadership team to review. And she said, hey, Avery, I just want you to know, you're the only person who selected the gender you selected, so your results are going to be really obvious. What would you like me to do about that? You know, people are going to be able to match your gender to all the other stuff you said, so would you like me to smooth it out, throw out your results? She gave me different options. That was really cool. Um, and finally, step number five is to replace othering with universal design. So this is coming from the disability justice community um, uh, of which I consider myself a part. And uh, this is back to, it's not just for trans people, it's for everyone. So, for example, uh, ask for pronouns on everyone's name badge. Good job, AlterConf. Um, that's a great thing to do uh, to normalize uh, providing pronouns. Um, avoid honorifics like Ms., Mr., or Mrs., um, unless they're absolutely necessary. You can usually get away with these days with a dear first name. Um, make it very, very easy to update your data uh, in those contexts that you originally provided online without having to talk to a human. Um, OkCupid is, is my, this is my second OkCupid example. Um, this is like the rat on OkCupid talk, but um, I used to have a very gendered username. So it's not just about name, also username. Um, you can change your username with OkCupid if you pay the money on a monthly basis to be like a plus user or something. And if you ever stop paying that money, guess what? Your username will revert. That's really annoying. Don't do that. Um, and then uh, if you're working with staff and volunteers, just include trans awareness training as a standard practice. Um, I can't tell you how much pain could be avoided on my part, my friends, um, being in situations where, for example, at an event, Somebody asks for a list of everybody attending an event, and they hand it out to the volunteers, and it's coming from the credit card information, which might have a, a different name than what I want people to, to see. Same thing with staff lists. If people in an organization ask each other for a staff list for an innocuous purpose and then pull it from payroll, you might get names that you would not want to disclose to anybody else in your organization. So just standard training on that kind of thing. Um, Require custom field options when you're considering vendors. So instead of trying to base how you structure your data on what the software offers, instead, base where, base where you spend your money on who offers you flexible um, options. And then uh, finally, on a similar note, uh, ask any partner organizations you work with if you're sharing data and you notice that maybe they aren't following these tips. For example, maybe they're asking for gender and it's either male or female and those are the only options. Go ahead and work with your partner organizations and make them aware of how maybe changes in their data um, could uh, make their organization more inclusive as well. All right, so I left a whole five minutes for questions because I love questions. Does anybody have a question about trans data, about queer data, anything over here? People have pointed out that it's inappropriate to use linguistic gymnastics to avoid the name or pronouns um, of someone who uses non-standard ones, let's say. Mm -hmm. Is there a corollary for that with data? Hmm. Can you give an example of avoiding linguistic gymnastics? Just to um, so have an idea of what you're doing. Like, like when people will restructure a sentence such that it avoids... Oh, to avoid... avoid Yes, um, yes, I'm familiar with this. Um, also, as a grammar geek. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think uh, it depends. Again, it, it comes back to your purpose. Like, there might be times when you need, let's say you're booking a flight for somebody, you unfortunately have to have their legal driver's license gender to book the flight with TSA. But if you're in a situation where you don't, not like that, where you don't have to have the information, um, you know, I think whenever possible, trying to convince the folks you're working with not to ask for information that they're not actually going to use or making it optional is really the best thing that I can think of in terms of, um, so like the honorifics is a good example because one way to do that is to actually offer a gender neutral option like mix, MX, um, is one way to get around that. But that's kind of an example where I'm like, well, why don't you just not include it if you can? Because often not including it makes it easier for everyone. I realize it doesn't always work, but I think whenever possible, try not to, to ask for something that's specifically gendered. I don't know if that answers your question at all, but yeah. I know a lot of times that, especially binary, ask binary uh, gender questions instead of as aimed at marketing. And 
what's if you are on the front building this end of it, what's a really good way to go to your people who don't want to spend money and say, no, we don't want to do this, we want to do something else. But this is marketing. We need to know this. That's a very good question. I'm actually um, doing some like business analytics courses and kind of rolling my eyes at a lot of it. But but you're right. I mean, you know, it's always like 18 to 35 male, female. Like that's how they do it. Um, so I think to whatever extent you can actually work with um, the folks at the table who might be interested, for example, in that marketing data and um, figure out is there an alternative. So like if they say we've got to ask for gender, that's important. Okay. So maybe maybe you'll waiver. Uh, sorry, maybe you'll um, compromise a little bit on that. But say, does it have to be male and female? Can we offer male, female, and then another option or one or more other options? Can we offer even if like if somebody really does not want to bid on this and is like trans stuff, I don't care. Can you at least do a decline to state? It's not great. It doesn't it doesn't show people that trans people are consumers and are people who are included in data. Um, but if you have to to get around it, I think decline to state. Um, can be a good option. Uh, yeah, touching on the whole marketing and granularity of data question, uh, do you think that it would be helpful for people to start doing that granularity and that marketing data by trends other than gender? For instance, if you're saying male 18 to 35, maybe it consumes transformers here that sort of takes you into a profile or a persona that uh, lets you look for trends. Because when it comes to like Transformers, most people are going to code that as masculine, but a lot of women grew up loving Transformers. So do you think that might be helpful? <laughs> a your example. Um, absolutely. So I almost feel like you fed me that question because one of my little like pet things is it annoys me. This is kind of a slightly separate topic, but it, it's similar is it annoys uh, annoys me that sexual orientation is a, a thing that's always determined by the gender you're interested in and like there aren't a lot of language we have for other things that I might be interested in about you other than your gender, right? I think you, you, you know what I'm talking about. So like I, I think that is really frustrating and it can be similar in marketing, right? The, the segmentation that we're looking at, now that we have tools where we can get all sorts of data, now the question of how much data you want to collect from people, I mean there is tension there. I think I believe a lot in privacy and I think, you know, that's tough, but if you're going to take something, if you're going to take some private information, then does it have to be gender or does gender have to be the only thing? Absolutely not. So yeah, I think that, that's a great uh, response to that marketing question is there are other segmentation that you might be able to get um, that, you know, is, is a little more useful than gender um, for given values of useful then. Absolutely. Thank you for that. All right. That's all the time. Uh, at Queer Activist, RadicallyQueer.com, there'll be lots more tips. Thank you very much.